In this PowerPoint, we're going to discuss calorimetry. This is the laboratory technique used to measure the amount of thermal energy that is released or absorbed during a chemical or physical change. There are two major types of calorimetry that we use in chemistry, constant pressure calorimetry and constant volume calorimetry. Both measure heat transferred into or out of a chemical reaction. The results from constant pressure calorimetry are used to calculate the enthalpy change for a reaction, or delta H. In contrast, the heat measured in constant volume calorimetry can be used to calculate changes in internal energy for a reaction, or delta U. So all forms of calorimetry utilize the law of conservation of energy and the fact that the heat transferred into or out of a chemical reaction must be exchanged with its surroundings. And a calorimeter is designed to contain and thermally isolate both the system and the surroundings. So remember that the system in thermochemistry is defined as the reactants and products undergoing change, while the surroundings are the substances immediately outside of the system. And ideally, we'd be able to measure the temperature change of the reactants and the products directly, and then calculate the heat that's transferred into or out of the system directly. However, the surroundings are usually much easier to measure the temperature of. Take, for an example, a chemical reaction that occurs in water. So this is an aqueous reaction like a precipitation one. And in these cases, water is the solvent or, me or medium for the reaction, but not an actual reactant or product. So it's not part of the system. It's part of the surroundings. But when we measure the temperature change in an aqueous reaction, we measure the temperature change of the most abundant component, the solvent water. So in other words, we measure the temperature change of the surroundings, not the system. And if we were to put an exothermic aqueous reaction into a calorimeter and measure the temperature changes the reactants and products mix, we'd actually see the temperature inside that calorimeter increase. And this is because heat is being released by those reactants and products and the water, the solvent in that calorimeter, absorbs the heat. And what we see is actually the temperature increase for the water, for the surroundings. In the same way, if we were to put an endothermic reaction into a calorimeter and measure the temperature change, we'd actually see the temperature drop. And this is because we're measuring the temperature change of the water, of the surroundings. So as the reactants and products absorb energy in an endothermic process, they draw that energy from the water that they are dissolved in. And so the temperature of the water drops. This is a picture of a simple constant pressure calorimeter. We'll use something very similar to this setup in lab. The coffee cups are used to thermally isolate the contents and make sure that any heat released or absorbed by the reaction inside is transferred only with the water inside that calorimeter. This type of setup is commonly used for measuring heat exchange for aqueous reactions. And as was described in the previous slide, water used as the solvent in these aqueous reactions is considered the surroundings. And the system are the reactants and products that are placed in the water. And since water is the most abundant substance in the solutions inside the calorimeter, when we measure the temperature change, we're really measuring the temperature change of the water. So we can use the temperature change of the water then to calculate the heat transfer into or out of the surroundings for the reaction. It's simply equal to the mass of the surroundings, the water, times the heat capacity, usually of water, times the temperature change.
We can then relate this heat flow into the surroundings using the law of conservation of energy to the heat flow out of the system or vice versa. So if the calorimeter is thermally isolated, that means that all the heat lost by the system must be absorbed by the surrounding water. Alternatively, if the system gained heat, it must have absorbed all of that from the surrounding water. The surrounding water must have lost all of that heat. Either way, the signs on the heat exchange of the system and the surroundings should cancel each other out, giving us a sum of zero. So a positive heat gain by the system is balanced by a negative heat loss by the surroundings and vice versa. Another way of stating this is that the heat of the system equals the negative of the heat of the surroundings. They're the same absolute value, but they are opposite in sign. And so if we've calculated the heat of the surroundings, the heat flow into or out of that, then we can relate it to the heat flow into or out of the system simply by applying a negative to our calculation for Q surroundings. So let's look at an example of a constant pressure calorimetry scenario. When 100 milliliters of a 0.2 molar sodium chloride solution and 100 milliliters of a 0.2 molar silver nitrate solution, both at 21.9 degrees Celsius, are mixed in a calorimeter, the temperature increases to 23.5 degrees Celsius as solid silver chloride forms. How much heat is produced by this precipitation reaction? So temperature rises in this reaction. And remember that we're measuring the temperature change of the surroundings in the calorimeter. So a rise in temperature indicates that heat is actually being released by our chemical reaction. And we're dealing with an exothermic process. And when dealing with aqueous reactions, we often replace system with Q reaction and Q surroundings with Q solution. The Q solution really refers to the water in the solution, though, which is why we can use the density and heat capacity of water in our calculations. And the full equation for the heat of the reaction, then, is the negative of the mass of the solution times the heat capacity of the solution times the temperature change of the solution. So we can define these terms based on what's given in the problem. And let's start with the mass of the solution. We'll have to convert the volumes that are given to mass using density. And we're told that we mix 100 milliliters each of the two separate solutions. So that's a combined total of 200 milliliters in that calorimeter. 200 milliliters times the density of one gram per every one milliliter gives us 200 grams of solution. That's the mass for our surroundings. The heat capacity is the same as water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And the change in temperature is final minus initial temperature. So 23.5 minus 21.9 degrees Celsius. And this gives us 1.6 degrees Celsius. We substitute these values into our formula for Q of reaction. And don't forget the negative sign as part of this formula. It switches everything from the surroundings to the reaction. So negative 200 grams times 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius times 1.6 degrees Celsius our units cancel out, and it gives us negative 1,388.88 joules. And this is a little bit of a larger number, so we can convert it into kilojoules, and we can round to three significant figures, the same as our measurements in the problem. 
and we get negative 1.39 kilojoules of heat released from this reaction. And the negative value in our heat is consistent with an exothermic process. If the process had been endothermic, we would expect to get a positive Q. And what we would find in an endothermic reaction in the calorimeter is that we would see the temperature drop. So our final temperature would be less than our initial. This would give us a negative delta T, which would then be canceled by the negative value in our formula for Q reaction. And we would end up with a positive value overall. So this type of calorimeter is known as a constant pressure calorimeter because it's not airtight. The pressure inside the calorimeter is the same as atmospheric pressure, and it doesn't really change over the course of the reaction. Now, by definition, the change in enthalpy of a reaction is the heat of that reaction measured at constant pressure. So we can use our results from a constant pressure calorimeter to calculate the enthalpy change for any particular reaction. But remember that uh, by convention, we scale the heat of reaction by the moles of the substances reacting when we calculate that change in enthalpy. So we have one more calculation to complete in order to convert our heat of reaction, our Q reaction, into delta H, our enthalpy change. So let's apply that additional step to the problem that we just completed. And we want to know what the enthalpy change, delta H, is for this particular reaction per mole of sodium chloride reacting. And the moles that you use for calculating enthalpy are usually whichever reactant or product has a 1 coefficient in the balanced chemical equation. This makes it easier to use the enthalpy in stoichiometry calculations, and we'll talk more about this in a later PowerPoint. In this case, sodium chloride has a 1 coefficient for the balanced chemical equation, so we can use it to calculate our enthalpy. But we'd actually get the same results using the moles of any of the other reactants or products since they all have a 1 coefficient. So to calculate the change in enthalpy using our heat of reaction, we just need to calculate the moles of sodium chloride that reacted in the calorimeter and divide it into Q reaction. So we mixed 100 mils of a 0.2 molar solution of sodium chloride. We can use our molarity formula of moles per liter of solution to convert the volume of sodium chloride we start with into moles. We have to use the original volume of the sodium chloride solution before mixing because the molarity of sodium chloride that we're given refers to the solution before it's mixed. We also have to convert milliliters into liters by moving the decimal three places to the left or multiplying by 10 to the negative three liters per every one milliliter. And 0.200 M, capital M, is the same as saying you have 0.200 moles of sodium chloride or solute for every one liter of solution. So if we write molarity as 0.200 moles over one liter, we can see that our liters will cancel out, leaving us with moles of sodium chloride, 0 0.0200 moles to be exact. And we can take these moles of sodium chloride in our reaction and divide it into the heat, Q reaction, that we calculated from our temperature data. And we get negative 69.4 kilojoules per mole. So in the previous example, the reaction occurred in solution. It was aqueous. But there are a variety of important reactions that can't occur directly in water. For example, combustion. Things won't burn when they're submerged in water. 
So how do we measure the heat energy released by these processes? We have to use a special type of calorimeter known as a bomb calorimeter. And on the left, you have a picture of an actual bomb calorimeter. On, and on the right is a diagram cut away so that you can see what the interior looks like. And it is a carefully controlled device. The combustion reaction occurs in air in a sealed container known as the bomb. So the reactants are actually placed in a sample cup inside the bomb, and it's then filled with oxygen gas to ensure complete combustion of everything in there. The reaction is started by using electricity to ignite the material. And then uh, the reaction occurs. Gases are produced as a part of the combustion process. The bomb itself is a rigid fixed volume container. It's airtight, so all of the gases are contained and the pressure inside the container builds up. That's why it's called a bomb. That bomb is actually submerged in a larger insulated container of water. And so when the material inside the bomb is combusted, it releases heat. And that heat is transferred from the system inside the bomb to the surroundings. And the surroundings in this case include the metal of that bomb container as well as the water that's surrounding it. The temperature change of the water is measured using a thermometer, and it's assumed that the metal of the bomb container is actually in thermal equilibrium with the water, so it undergoes the same temperature change. And from the temperature change that's measured, the heat of the surroundings uh, can be calculated and related back to the heat released by the combustion process. So let's look at an example of this type of calorimetry. So we're going to combust 0.963 grams of benzene, which has the chemical formula C6H6, in a bomb calorimeter. When we do so, the temperature of the calorimeter increases by 8.39 degrees Celsius. Now the bomb inside that calorimeter has a heat capacity of 784 joules per degree Celsius, and it's submerged in 925 mils of water, which has a heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius and a density of one gram per milliliter. How much heat was produced by the combustion of this benzene sample? So we know that the heat that was released by the benzene was absorbed by its surroundings, which are the calorimeter, and that includes the bomb as well as the water surrounding the bomb. So we can also say that Q reaction equals the negative of the heat absorbed by the water and the heat absorbed by the bomb. So in order to calculate these two substances, we have to use our heat capacity formulas. They're going to look slightly different because the heat capacities that we were given for the water and for the bomb are slightly different. Let's start with the water. We're going to use the regular specific heat capacity formula that we've used already, mass of water times the specific heat capacity of water times the change in temperature. We have to calculate the mass of the water, um, but we know that the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So if we have 925 milliliters, then we have 925 grams. Our specific heat capacity is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and our change in temperature of the calorimeter, it increased by 8.39 degrees Celsius. So even though we don't have a final and initial temperature, we do have the change in temperature, that 8.39 degrees Celsius. So we can substitute that directly into our formula. For the heat absorbed by the bomb, though, notice that um, our heat capacity is actually in joules per degree Celsius. We have no gram term, which means that the formula we use for calculating the heat absorbed by the calorimeter does not have a mass term. It is simply the heat capacity of the bomb times the change in temperature of the calorimeter. So this is a uh, special type of uh, heat capacity. Um, specific heat capacity is actually specific to the identity of the substance, and it can be applied to any amount of that particular substance. 
heat capacity, which is usually um, denoted with a capital C instead of the lowercase c symbol, heat capacity is very specific to one particular object. Um, and if you use a different object, if we used a different bomb inside that uh, calorimeter, we would have a different heat capacity associated with it. So this is something that's been experimentally measured to be associated with that particular part that was inserted into the calorimeter. So, um, so it's known as heat capacity instead of specific heat capacity. The temperature change for our bomb it's assumed that that's in thermal equilibrium with the water, so that temperature change is also 8.39 degrees Celsius. So we can substitute these two formulas for the heat absorbed by the water and the heat absorbed by the bomb into our equation here. And then we can substitute into that our different values for the mass of the water times the specific heat capacity of the water times the temperature change plus the heat capacity of the bomb times the temperature change. Notice that in terms of our units, the grams cancel out in the first term for water as well as the degree Celsius. In the second term for the bomb, degree Celsius cancel out. What this leaves us with for both terms are final units of joules, which we can add together. So we can do that. We can plug this straight into our calculator, multiplying and adding. And what we end up with is Q of the reaction equals negative, and the negative is carried down from the formula, 8,005.738 joules. And of course, we can convert this to kilojoules because that's a pretty large number. Um, so we divide by 1,000 or move the decimal place three spaces to the left, and we get negative 8.01 kilojoules, and I round it to three significant figures to match the least significant figures in my measurements above. So when you burn 0.963 grams of benzene, you release 8.01 kilojoules of heat. So the heat measured in a constant volume calorimeter can be used to calculate changes in internal energy, or delta U. And remember that delta U equals the total energy transferred in terms of both heat and work. And we define work as the negative of pressure times the change in volume, delta, D, delta V, for reactions with gases. Now, in a constant volume calorimeter, we actually have no change in volume. Our delta V is zero, which means that our work term is zero. And this means that we keep energy from being transferred in the form of work in a bomb calorimeter. And the energy that would have been expended with gases expanding, it is still released. It is simply transformed into a greater heat transfer for the reaction. And the net result is that the heat measured in a bomb calorimeter at constant volume is actually larger than that measured at constant pressure for reactions with expanding gases. At constant pressure, the gases are allowed to expand and do work, so that energy is actually released as work instead of heat. So you should note that this difference only applies to reactions with expanding or even contracting gases. For all other reactions, the heat measured in a bomb calorimeter will be the same as that measured in a constant pressure calorimeter. Now we can use the heat of reaction measured at constant volume to calculate delta U in the same way that we calculated the enthalpy change, delta H, for constant pressure heats of reaction. We simply divide Q reaction from our calorimetry by the number of moles of substance reacting. So let's look at an example. 
So we calculated the heat released by the combustion of 0.963 grams of benzene in a bomb calorimeter. Let's take this one step further and calculate the change in internal energy, delta U, for that combustion process per mole of benzene reacting. In order to do this, we just need to calculate the moles of benzene in 0 0.963 grams. So this is a mass. To convert to moles, we divide by the molar mass of benzene, 78.12 grams, based on the formula C6H6. And we end up with 0 0.01233 moles of benzene used in this calorimeter. We divide that into the heat of reaction that we calculated, negative 8.01 kilojoules, and we get negative 6.50 times 10 to the second kilojoules per mole when we round our answer to three significant figures, the same as what we have in the problem. In summary, in calorimetry, the heat flow into or out of surroundings contained within the calorimeter is measured. And the heat change of these surroundings is then related to the heat released or absorbed by the chemical reaction, the system contained within the calorimeter, such that Q of reaction equals the negative of Q of surroundings. And in constant pressure calorimetry, the reaction is open to atmospheric pressure. And Q of reaction can be used to calculate the change in enthalpy, or delta H, for that reaction. In constant volume calorimetry, any gases produced in that reaction are not allowed to transfer energy as work. As a result, the Q of reaction measured in constant volume calorimetry can be used to calculate the change in internal energy, or delta U, of the reaction.